people. But Warwick, actually, although I, I chose Warwick because I had some aspirations to be involved in politics, I partly didn't know what kind of politics, by the way, which I'll just show you, mm. but I had a romantic notion of, you know, being a student activist. And on the day I went for the interview, they were having an occupation. And I kind of really liked that. <laughs> um, whereas when I went to York University on my interview, I kind of thought it was a bit dull looking and all of these kind of things. So it was not a very well-informed uh, choice. So when I went to Warwick, um, it was, however, a bit of an Oxbridge reject university. So I just happened to be in a hall of residence where everybody had been to private school. Everybody doing English hadn't, but... But and I was subject to you know some pretty um, it, clear you know snobbery basically. Mm. But it was because I hadn't really realised that people would have that attitude because you know people yeah I hear these are cliches gone mad aren't they? I realised that my parents had given me a great deal of confidence. I don't think I knew that. I didn't. I was probably an annoying, bullshit, you know, confident, overconfident 18-year-old. But somehow they'd made me think, you know, that I had, I could do lots of things. And so I was surprised when people thought, you know, looked down on me. And it, and it shook my confidence. I, you know, I, things like I, I put on weight. I mean, you know, like I'd been never put on weight. I'd always been the same weight, you know, mm. and I, I... I really struggled to kind of find who, you know, I didn't know, I mean, I, I was lonely and I felt and I felt very small and all that. It's funny because in a sense universities shouldn't be lonely places, but no. I think if, if you don't make friends in the first week, your first year can be absolute hell. Yeah, I, so I didn't have a good first year. I did make friends, but they weren't friends that I kept. They, so I had a tough first year. Uh, once I got involved in politics... I, I really enjoyed it, and I, but I didn't get involved in politics to make friends. I, but I did spend my first year going to general meetings and working out where I stood. And in those days, imagine how this is how old I am. That there used to be about a thousand people every week that attended the union general meeting in this huge, expanse of a place in the student union, and I would sit at the back. And listen to the arguments, you know, and in, you know, as you all know, there was every brand of revolutionary through to actually some quite far right, uh, uh, pretty lively mix politically. I learned who I liked. I listened to all the arguments. I read voraciously and I thought, I'm going to get involved in politics next year. And I started going to political meetings a bit then. And then that changed everything. And that's the voice of Baroness Claire Fox, who progressed from getting involved in student politics to become an MEP and now a member of the House of Lords. You can listen to my full chat with her, 75 minutes, by going to Iandale All Talk on Global Player. Coming up in a moment, it's Cross Question. We have Sam Tarry, Labour MP for Ilford South, Alicia Cairns, Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, uh, Paul Mason, journalist and author, and Phoebe Arslanovic, who is... Wait, sorry, Wakefield. I knew... I promise I'll get it right one day. Who is chair of the Women in Think Tanks Forum and a political commentator? 0345 6060973 is the number to call to put a question to our panel. And don't forget, you can watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player, and play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, President Biden has told the UN that the war in Ukraine is shameless, while Liz Truss says Moscow's latest move is a statement of weakness. It says the Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country will use all means at our disposal to protect itself. Joe Biden has been addressing the UN General Assembly in New York. This world should see these outrageous acts for what they are. Putin claims he had to act, but no one threatened Russia and no one other than Russia sought conflict. New York's Attorney General is suing former US President Donald Trump and his eldest three children for fraud. It's after a three-year civil investigation into whether his organisation misstated the values of its real estate properties. He denies wrongdoing. The reward to find those responsible for killing Olivia Pratt Corbell has increased to £200,000. The nine-year-old was shot and killed in Liverpool last month.
Businesses have largely welcomed a six-month price cap on the energy bills from next month. The government says it plans will see costs will be around half of what companies were expecting this winter, but Labour says it's come too late. LBC Markets report the FTSE 100 has closed up 44 points at 72.37. The pound buys $1.13 and €1.14. LBC weather, heavy rain for Northern Ireland and the rest of Scotland tonight. Elsewhere staying dry with a low of nine. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello and a very good evening and welcome to Wednesday's edition of Cross Question. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel, 0345 6060 973. You can watch us on Global Player and why wouldn't you? We have the most beautiful panel you could imagine tonight. Starting off with the awesome Sam Tarry, Labour MP for Ilford South. And sometimes I'm not going to have to think of an adjective for all of you. Maybe we'll stop there. Um, Alicia Cairns is Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and the National Security Strategy Committee. Committee. Paul Mason is a journalist and author and the author of How to Stop Fascism. The paperback is out right now. And Phoebe Aslanovic uh, Wakefield is a political commentator who's chair of the Women in Think Tanks Forum. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Now, Alicia, I said you're a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. You have a bit of an announcement to make. We're going to commit news now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, the news that everyone in the wait country has been waiting exactly. for on the tip of their toes. Um, no, I am going to stand for chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. It's, I'm a member of the committee. It's my great passion. Um, look, I know how the Foreign Office works. I know how, what's, under the, what's under the bonnet, how the engine works, where the skirtings are hidden. Um, and I think I can make a meaningful difference. And obviously, it's now for me to put that argument to my colleagues and hope that they agree. Sam, do you, do you agree? Because oh, it's it the choice to... of Alicia, Liam Fox, or Ian Duncan Smith. I think I know where my vote's going. Uh, do you, you get a vote, don't you? We do. It's cross house. Yeah. Actually, in committees mm -hmm. like that, it's you know we forget all the sort of ding donging that you see in the chamber. Yeah. And we have to make informed decisions about every addition to those committees. Because obviously, if Alicia gets that post, you know it's one of the biggest and most important committees we have in Parliament. Very powerful, overseeing obviously you know some incredibly mm. important global issues. So it's something all MPs do. You know, I'll be lobbied, I'm sure, by other MPs who are standing for that to think about and to vote and you know it's not necessarily done on party lines in that sense so you got your first endorsement there <laughs> i'm very grateful yeah my <laughs> first public endorsement no know, absolutely <laughs> sam i hope we'll be uh, ringing all your all right well it's, it's foreign affairs that we're going to start with ben in harringay has our first question ben hello what would you like to ask hello uh, ian and panel um i i've got a question um is putin's threats liz truss's falklands moment just explain why you think it might be. Well, because during the campaign, her campaign uh, was a lot of uh, sort of jingoistic stuff, like uh, getting into tanks and all that sort of stuff. Um, to be to be prime minister, this is long before she stood for uh, against uh, Rishi Sunak, um, and it, she would revel in it, and that's what she'll do. And uh, if if Putin isn't deposed, which I believe will be deposed within the next six months, um, um, then it, it is, in my opinion, Liz Truss's Falklands moment, because everything else... OK. You, if you think of Thatcher, then that's what she done, and she won the election. Well, she did actually fight... A, I mean, she led Britain into a war over the Falklands. I think it's slightly different here. But anyway, so the question is, do you think Putin's threats will end up being Liz Truss's Falklands moment? Paul Mason. I don't know anybody who is reveling in this confrontation with Putin. It is scary. Uh, the guy went on TV this morning and basically implicitly threatened to use, use a nuclear weapon. Should the Ukrainians simply fight for their own territory? Um, and I think that we've had a very sober and cross-party response here, actually, to, to the, the aggression by Putin. I was a campaigner and a Labour Party member in, during the Falklands War and opposed that war and went on the streets, uh, I think, for good reasons. Um, but you won't see that level of uh, political difference inside Britain over this. And I think we're talking about an order of magnitude. It, 
the Falklands War was a, a war of choice by the United Kingdom. Even for Margaret Thatcher, she that famously was thinking about just letting it lie and was persuaded to, to try and take the, the Falklands, Malvinas Islands back. This is not a war of choice for us in the West. We we have simply well, supported a democracy. So, because Argentina, a fascist junta, invaded British territory oh, no. here. Yeah. Well, it did. Yeah. I mean, it, no, it absolutely it, no, did. No, no, it did. But we, the United Kingdom, have not chosen to fight. In fact, we have chosen not to fight uh, Vladimir Putin. We are supporting uh, strongly and correctly, uh, and probably not enough uh, now, given what's happened, the Ukrainian uh, government in its in its desire to defend itself. I think we should go on doing that. But what, what, what I think what your caller was getting at was the idea that Truss might have, because she's been sitting on tanks and, you know, sort of posing as Margaret Thatcher, might be wanting to use this moment as some kind of a party political thing to turn a potential uh, moment of unpopularity. Far from it. I think the moment of the moment of crisis that's coming in this country is the, is the energy crisis. We are going to have to face that as united as we can. We'll have political differences about how we pay for the for the energy bailout, I'm sure the listeners will want to talk about. But I think that, no, I don't sense that it's one of those moments where one party takes ownership of a political uh, um, geopolitical crisis and then sort of uses it for partisan means. And that, as you know, Ian, you know, so, as someone who's on the left, left of Labour, I've spent the last six months since I came back from Kiev trying to avoid that happening. I'm very glad mm. that Labour Party and uh, Sam, you know, former front venture, we supported what the government has done. Yeah, and and I think you're absolutely right. This has, I, there aren't many people apart from the Stop the War Coalition in this country who are against Britain, what Britain is doing, and it has had a cross party, uh, cross party support. Um, Alicia, you didn't support Liz Truss. Do you think she's going to turn this into a Falklands moment if the Ukrainians prevail? Yeah. I actually agree with Paul that it's fundamentally different in that I think it's about how people will experience it. Um, the Falklands was a long way away and it was a, a moment of marshalling the strength of Britain at a time where people thought it was waning, which you could draw parallels to today. Um, but it was a long way away. People didn't experience, people didn't feel it. Whereas with this, because of the resulting cost of living crisis, because of the energy crisis, people will feel it. They're not looking for Liz to make it a Falklands moment. And I think it'd be mistaken if anyone was to try and do that. Um, but I think also there's a lot of questions that still want to be answers that are far more complex than the way we discuss foreign policy in this modern day and age, where I think for us to ever see a repeat of a Falklands moment would be incredibly difficult mm. because of that level of debate and challenge that we rightly now have an understanding of, of conflict. And also, I mean, I don't know Liz Truss that well, but if you look at how she's behaved in her first couple of weeks as Prime Minister, she hasn't been very showy. I mean, okay, you could argue, well, circumstances have dictated mm. that. And I think a lot of people have they quite liked the contrast between her and Boris Johnson, whereas he was very showy, and she's been quite mm. unfussy. Well, I think if you look at her first PMQs, which was really the only thing we saw from her before um, the Queen's death, she was actually very focused on, this is my ideology, mm. these are the facts I want to put across, and it was very different, less of that performance, less of that Boris felt himself to be a gladiator. He needed people throwing sand in his eyes. He needed the booing. He needed the crowd or else he couldn't perform. Liz appeared to be very different and actually loving the chance to put across her ideology. So I think we don't yet know how she's going to perform, but that is very different from what we've had until now. Sam Terry. If she's putting across her ideology, which is about huge tax cuts for the rich and not standing up to energy companies and sort of global interests who are doing very, very well at the time and most British people are suffering, and um, bring on the general election is what I would say, because I don't think people are up for that kind of ideology. You know, we're in a situation where actually the government has been so feeble in the processes it's brought forward, the ideas it's brought forward, and I'm afraid, you know, what's been sort of uh, given a prelude of uh, on Friday's uh, statement uh, on the economy, I think is going to be really... Kind Kind of uh, weak lemonade in terms of what we need. We're potentially facing a situation not just after the energy crisis where our country goes into one of the worst recessions in my lifetime, in fact probably any of our lifetimes. You know, we need really bold answers and tinkering around the edges of a fundamentally... £150 billion pound package, is that tinkering around the edges? What was announced today for business, is that tinkering around sure. the edges? I don't believe that my constituents in Ilford South are really, you know, I spoke to someone on the doorstep literally today and he said, two and a half thousand pounds. He says, are you having a laugh? Is that all they're going to do? And, um, you know, for the top end, for the people at the top 5%, top 1%, I'm sure this is going to be great. But we need real help directed at the poorest in society. Okay, let's go back to the question about Liz Truss and the Falklands. 
I mean, I, I, I agree with Paul. I just don't see this in the same kind of, you know, she would be absolutely crazy. And I don't think people in any party and most of our voters, Conservative or Labour, would support us using that moment. This is a fundamentally different situation. We get into a hot war conflict with Russia. You know that is literally the beginning of a third world war situation with two, you know, n- you know halves of the hemispheres that are nuclear uh, armed. Putin is clearly getting more desperate, clearly getting more dangerous. You know, I'm someone that's clearly on the left and, you know, wants to see conflicts resolved. But I've also been very supportive of making sure the Ukrainian people and their army, because I do believe in democracy, have had the weapons, the resources. And I think that probably needs to be upscaled because they're actually, you know, looking by all accounts, a fairly valiant fight back in parts of Ukraine. You were all probably listening um, to the last caller that I had on um, in the in the last hour, who was advocating uh, peace negotiations and saying that the Russians should be allowed to keep most of the territory that they've uh, taken. Um, I, should we say, argued fairly vociferously <laughs> against that. Um, but there is going to have to be a peace at some point, isn't there? How how do people judge when that should be? I mean, I said it should be left to Zelensky to decide when that should be. Um, but there are all sorts of different views on that. Where, where do you stand on that? Look, I mean, there are clearly some parts of Ukraine where there are people who are Russian-speaking who do see their allegiances towards Moscow. That is a fact. But is that the vast majority of people in those regions? Would there be fair elections, you know, plebiscites? You know, that is also somewhat doubtful. I guess my first starting position would be the sooner the war can be ended and there can be a truce and people are not dying, the better. Um, it isn't for me to say where those lines of a new border should be drawn. I do believe probably President Zelensky, you know, the Ukrainian people will have their view on that. Um, and, you know, in any war, there are victors, you know, there are losers. We may be in a situation where not all of Ukraine, in the eyes of Zelensky, will be liberated. You know, he has to make a decision at some point about how many tens of thousands of more people die over what could be a very protracted war. But it wouldn't be right for me to, to say that because actually if people want to be liberated, then they can fight for that. Just before I come to Phoebe, Alicia, where, where do you stand on this? Because there is a school of thought that says, well, you don't strike a peace deal until you've won. And, and that would include Crimea being taken back as well. So my issue is that this is the second illegal invasion. And the reason there's been able to be a second illegal invasion is because last time round, we were also desperate to prevent further fallout and further blood loss and further uh, conflict that we allowed these performative democracies, these hostage um, referendums to go ahead without being challenged enough. And we didn't tackle it enough and we didn't fight Russia then when we should have stood up for the Ukraine people and allowed them to have their say. And this is one of my big problems with Liz Truss's foreign policy is that throughout this time she keeps saying Putin must lose. That doesn't mean anything. At some point you have to start explaining what does that look like. But as for your caller's suggestion that we should be calling for peace talks, that is not for us to call for. That is not for us to say it is for Ukraine to do so. We've said we'll be their ally. Obviously, there have to be lines at some point. But for now, we stand behind them and we allow them to dictate that and look at the progress made in the last few weeks. Phoebe, let's just remind ourselves of the question. Do you think Putin's threats will end up being Liz Truss's Falklands moment? Well, Thatcher had a Falklands moment because she didn't blink. And let's think about why it is that Putin is making amazing reports, you know, success after success on the ground for Ukrainian forces in the past few weeks. What he's hoping to do with these nuclear threats is to drive a wedge between Zelensky and his allies in the West, including the UK and the US. I don't think trust will blink. I don't think she's going to be swayed by that. And I'm glad. Paul, quick final word. I think the... We should be talking about escalating. I, I don't. I don't take the view. I take the view self determination. Uh, Ukraine decides its own future, and I don't think we should be talking at all about new borders. The borders are there, um, and they include Crimea. Um, but Putin's threat this morning wasn't to Zelensky. It was to us. It's to, it's aimed at the UN, and there are things that we could be doing. Um, and I hope that the MPs will take this on board. We. We sent uh, an anti-tank missile called the Enlaw, which is made in Belfast. It made a big difference. We've run out of them. We've run out of them for ourselves. There's no contract yet to get some more. Um, the, the, you know, you, I think one of your callers was talking. He'd been to Ukraine, mm. taken 80 flak jackets himself, and people need boots. I have that same, imp- uh, same experience. I'm working in solidarity with trade unions and human rights groups in Ukraine, then they've got nothing. We could be doing a lot more and we need to be saying to to Putin that in the unthinkable event that he were to use a nuclear weapon in the post-war world, then, the you know, we need to be creating pariah status in advance for this 
a regime and this government. I think we should just knock up uh, a, a, a court somewhere in a neutral country, uh, ready with a nice leather chair for Vladimir Putin to be put on trial in. And forget... Don't tell me you have one in The Hague. Well, he's, he's, they're not signatories to the ICC, so technically it couldn't be The Hague, but Nuremberg was a, an ad hoc court, and we should be preparing Putin's Nuremberg because the pictures and the events... The courtroom is still there. I visited it. Yes, and I think, uh, well, <laughs> you could... You, the second Nuremberg tribunal could mm. easily be for Vladimir well, that's Putin. a thought. Mm. Two news stories we've created already on this program. <laughs> uh, we'll take Ben. Thank you very much for your call. We'll take more of your questions in a moment. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. It's sixteen minutes past eight. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I could repeat what Tassam just said. 18 minutes past eight. We were just uh, having a bit of a laugh over this story that the animal rights group PETA have um, brought out today, where they're saying that women should deny men sex because they're responsible for most global warming. We will be talking about that at half past nine. Should you wish to question us about that, you're, you're very free to do so. Maybe our final question, I don't know. Um, right, with us in the studio, Sam Tarry, Labour MP for Ilford South, Alicia Cairns, Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, Paul Mason, journalist and author, and Phoebe Arslanovic... <laughs> Phoebe Arslanovic Wakefield. Where did you get that surname? It's it's Bosnian Muslim. Is it? I'm Bosnian Muslim, and then the rest, Wakefield's from Very my dad. Yeah, so it's quite a nice mix, actually, isn't it? So sort of, you can get a much more English surname than Wakefield, I suppose, could you? Uh, Yes, mm. yes, I guess so. And then I threw I threw Arsenal Gitch in there just to make life difficult for English people. Thank you very me much. We, we, we appreciate it. And Phoebe is a political commentator and chair of the Women in Think Tanks Forum. Right, next question from Martin in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Hi, I'm Ian and panel. Yeah, and the question is, is I'm on the sick and I'm, I'm on benefits. I will at least trust mini budget on Friday. Help me. Well, I suppose, Alicia, you could say, we'll wait till Friday and we'll see. But I mean, a lot of it has been briefed in advance, hasn't it? Well, my, my priority is it has to. You know, that is exactly the point. You know, Conservatives argue whether we should be helping the most vulnerable or the just about managing and the most vulnerable. For me, it's absolutely about prioritising and the kind of crisis we're facing, those who most need help. And it is people like Sean. Um, look, you know, I recognise Sam, what Sam was saying earlier about we need to go as far as we can, we need to do as much as we can for people. But £2,500 for most people is a lot of money and it is a lot of support when you add it up into the numbers you're looking at. And it is really difficult for the government. You know, we've just had the pandemic. We've got to support Ukraine because they are supporting our insecurity. The money is not endless, but at the same time, we cannot allow people to go into destitution. You know, we've seen the business energy relief scheme announced today. That's going to halve the cost of businesses of gas over winter, we hope. That is a good move. 
But look, am I going to be tough on the government on Friday if we don't see what we need to see? Absolutely, because but what, what, really what if they uh, take away the cap on bankers' bonuses? What if yeah. they cut stamp duty for homeowners? I mean, the, these are not things that are going to help people yeah. who are in the most need of help. Yeah. So I think on stamp duty, that is a good idea in that it helps people pay into something that actually ends up helping them as long as it gets the market moving, which is the key thing. It's about driving down prices to get the market moving. On bankers' bonuses, I have to say I do struggle with understanding why that is something they are looking at now, why in the current climate you would ever even consider it talking about it and why it would be a priority. But at the same time, it might not happen. It might be one of those things that get briefed out I'm all the time. Well it's not mm. It has been fairly well briefed, but if I was the opposition, I'd be briefing it to every blooming paper as well. Um, so that we have to see. But, I think the briefings you know, have come from within government rather than the opposition, <laughs> well, As you can see, fair. I'm not a member of the government. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, I do think that's... I don't understand why you would be looking at that or focusing on that. I know the argument... And and it is factual that when the city does well, the country does well. Absolutely, without question. I know that that's right. But do I think bankers' bonuses is something we should be talking about at the moment? No, I absolutely don't know. And I wouldn't be if I was in government. Sam Terry, what do you think is going to happen on Friday? And what do you hope will happen on Friday? I think it, from what's been trailed, I mean, I read something the other day talking about even setting up new tax zones. Essentially, this, this reminds me of something that Doug, Douglas Carswell came out with, a plan for tax competition between different areas of the UK. I mean, this is economic shock therapy that we don't need. You know, clearly... But we've had that we've before got with development cooperations. Pe people given tax This is actually talking about to, lower to... Tax, personal tax uh, brackets for people living in different parts of the country. So, you know, it might be if you lived in Wolverhampton, you'd have one rate to encourage businesses there and perhaps you have a different one in Ilford. I don't know. But to me... You know, it, it moves massively away from the idea of progressive taxation, those with the widest shoulders paying most. And actually, I think this stuff about bankers' bonuses is absolutely appalling, quite frankly. Um, in, you know, I have a community that has both the poorest and also quite well-off middle-class people who do commute from Milford to work in Canary Wharf in the city. You know, but even those people are saying that at the moment the economy is so unbalanced, it needs to be fundamentally restructured. And this actually, in my view, is some of the things that have been trailed and proposed is going to lead to an even more unequal economy with more wealth percolating to the top. You know, this even... We've got a situation where Joe Biden, the president of the US, is clearly well to the left in his economic approach than our own prime minister. That is astonishing, you know, in terms of the Anglo-Saxon well, he's model. a Democrat. The, the reality is, well, <laughs> we've always been in a situation where, you know, even the Democrats have not necessarily been particularly on the economic sort of left side of things. We need a rebalance in the economy. It needs to be through job creation. It needs to be in investment into industries that are going to be creating jobs in communities that need those jobs, that are well-paid, I would obviously argue unionised and long term. You know that is where that money should be focused on. It just seems to me quick fixes that you know people. Oh, of course, no one wants to pay more tax. No one likes to pay tax. But the reality is, you know, we are moving away from a aggressive taxation system. And in fact, actually, it's all it's going to mean quite simply is the poor get poorer and the rich get richer, and that is not acceptable. What do I hope to see? I would like to see them announcing tens of billions of pounds for investment into new green economies going and actually, instead of the fake levelling up agenda they had before, actually going and explaining to parts of the country that haven't had real investment for decades how they're going to create jobs that last for a long period of time. Even if they turn around and said, actually, we're going to insulate every home in Britain, you know, creating 100,000 jobs. If they said instead, actually, we're going to invest in the hydrogen economy rather than just trying to buy Chinese batteries all the time. You could even have quite a patriotic agenda for rebuilding our economy that gives people real jobs and gives people hope. You know, that's what I'd like to hear on Friday. Some hope. The, the, the point about jobs, I think, is an interesting one because at the moment no. we have the lowest unemployment we've ever had, and we've got jobs, job vacancies all over the economy that are not being filled. So, I mean, I, look, I'm with you in wanting to create new jobs, but if you haven't got the people to fill them, and I think that following COVID, I think there's been a dramatic realignment in the workforce and that a lot of people have just come out of the workforce for, we, for whatever reason. Sure, but that's because we've headed towards a low-wage economy. You know, we've had a decade of austerity, we've had real wages not rising. You know, people know that I was famously sacked for standing on a picket line and striking workers. We are going into the biggest period of not just economic unrest, but industrial unrest in every sector of the economy. And it's not just militant, you know, train drivers, whatever. Barristers talking about going on strike, teachers, nurses, you know, people who 
we would never even consider doing this sort of thing because wages have not been rising in level of inflation. Well, Liz Truss says she wants a high wage economy. Well, great, but you know, I've heard absolutely zero that's going to deliver that as well, of Friday. We may hear it on Friday. You but never also just know. The one thing I would add though is the whole point with the quickly. big job market is you have the choice to be able to, it is the job seekers' market. They can go and get a different job, they can go and fight for something else. They can I see it every single day people going to me going, I've just managed to get myself this pay rise by saying actually this company's gonna let me work from home for four days a week if you don't, so give me a pay rise and let me work from home. It's a buyer's market, That's isn't it? The want. jobs market we want at the it moment. To be a in buyer's a market. choice between working for Uber Eats or working for Deliveroo. I mean, that's not really a great choice. Look, you know, we need to be raising wages across the floor. You know, we need to actually get back to regional and uh, sectoral collective bargaining. We need to be enhancing rights. We're talking about destroying rights at work, uh, as well as you know, putting in place okay. economic measures Phoebe. to make people poorer. I know that Friday is only a mini budget. We've got the proper budget coming in November, but I've not been particularly impressed about what's come out so far. I mean, I, let's have some bigger, bolder ideas. I mean, um, all this stuff around cutting stamp duty, I mean, it'll probably heat the property market up even more. Most people agree stamp duty is not a particularly good tax. It's, you know, gums up the property market. Well, let's throw it out. Let's have a proportional property tax <laughs> instead. That's something that has buy-in on the right and the left. Or um, you know, let's let's you know make make more land available for home building. Let's have an, uh, an ambitious house building plan. Like why aren't, why aren't these ideas being being looked at instead of just heating up the property market more and more and more? Um, or what's coming out on Friday? You know, stuff like freezing corporation tax. I mean, that's something we've been doing in this country for quite a long time. I'm not sure to the extent that we've seen much of a benefit. Let's have something fresh. Paul, well, Martin. Um I'm sorry to say, I don't think you're going to get much out of Friday's fiscal event or mini-budget. Because we've got a government here that rightly, and let's pay tribute to this, is saying we need growth. And why I say this as a, as a e former economics correspondent is that almost every other developed country is going for recession. They, they have a policy of raising interest rates and raising taxes at the same time, tightening the economy. I'm glad that we have now won in this country against Rishi Sunak uh, the argument for expansion. The problem we have with Liz Truss is that she and Kwasi Kwarteng believe that the growth itself trickles down to people like Martin, to people like m many of the people listening to this who are on low pay or benefits, disability benefits, whatever. Um, and it doesn't. That's been tried. You will only get growth that enhances the well-being of people in this country when you get two things right, investment and redistribution, that is sharing the wealth. But you know, the, the reason we're going into a five, six quarter recession is because as prices have risen for food and energy, wages have not kept up. And it is the policy of the Bank of England that they should not keep up. And it's the policy of the government. But if you go to growth and you've already got rampant inflation in the economy, Surely that just means that inflation is here for, for a long time to come. That's what happened in the famous exactly. barber boom in the early 1970s. It is, and, I, and I'd be critical of the, if what we get from quasi quarting is another barber boom, that is a sugar rush of growth-enhancing measures like tax cuts without long-term incentives both for investment and for redistribution, so raising wages, I think you'd be right. Um, but no, I would still say that it's not growth that's causing the inflation. It's Vladimir Putin. It's the it's the energy war that's being perpetrated on our country. And I think that, so you've got levers, you know, shiny levers like the Bank of England, you pull interest rates this way or that. They're not going to work to sort this out. Short term, the, the big difference I would have with the government is it should have paid for the, for the energy bailout through windfall taxes and taxes on corporations. I'd be in favour of keeping corporation tax at 25%, not cutting it. Sure, well, it's not actually at 25%. Well, it, it should stopping be. the rise. Yeah, it, it longer term, but we're not, we're not thinking longer term. And I don't think we're going to get that from Quarting and Trust on Friday. The longer term has to be, how do you get money to come into this country and invest in, in exactly what we all want, high wage, high productivity, high growth, high skill, jobs. How do you get it to bring people back into the workforce? How do you get young people able to afford homes that can, you know, the secure tenancies or, or affordable uh, homes to buy? You get long-term in investment. An investment has flatlined since Brexit. It fell during COVID. It hasn't come back. And we, I think, on the left have a way of doing that and it is for the state to begin to shape that investment um, in ways that the Conservatives 
even when they wanted to do it under Johnson, they were all in favour of investment. Well, they just don't know how to do it. You, you've got an opportunity in our next question to expand on that a little bit. But um, uh, thank you very much indeed all for your answers in the first half of Cross Question. If you've got a question you'd like to put to our panel, 0345 973 It's half past eight. Let's get the latest news headlines from Serena Farrow. Five British nationals held by Russian-backed forces have been safely returned. The Prime Minister thanked the Ukrainian president to release the detainees and called for Russia to end the exploitation of prisoners of war. New York's Attorney General is suing Donald Trump and his three eldest children for fraud. It follows a civil investigation into the former president and his Trump organisation. He denies any wrongdoing. And a reward to find those responsible for the killer of Olivia Pratt Corbell has been increased to £200,000. The nine-year-old was shot and killed in her home in Liverpool last month. LBC weather, heavy rain for Northern Ireland and Scotland tonight, elsewhere staying pretty dry, with a low of nine degrees. LBC. Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale tweet at LBC 8.34 on LBC we have Phoebe Arslanagic Wakefield political commentator who's chair of the Women in Think Tanks Forum Paul Mason journalist and author How to Stop Fascism the paperback is out right now I think Paul correct did the hardback do very well of course it did all hardbacks do, like hardbacks <laughs> do, don't they, unless they're written by David Beckham. <laughs> Alicia Kearns is Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, an aspirant chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Sam Tarry is Labour MP for Ilford South, former Shadow Transport Minister. Sean in concert has the burning question of the hour. Sean, go ahead. Sam and uh, uh, Labour, do you think Labour will win the next election under Keir Starmer? <laughs> I'm Labour through and through, but I don't think you will. Paul Mason. Well, that's a cheery thought to start with, because if, <laughs> if, we, if we don't, then we've, we've, we've just, we've failed miserably. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a mere Labour member, but I should say you know, to your viewers, that I, uh, listeners, I, I am a Labour uh, uh, member. No, I think it's entirely possible. Uh, and I think the reason is, for what we've just been discussing, um, I don't think Liz Truss has a strategy to dig this country out of the crisis that it's in. And I think people are wanting a change. And 
You know, she, there is a move, there is a difference between uh, Truss and uh, and Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was pretty obsessed with levelling up. I don't think he did much. I don't think he achieved much. But he, he kind of had a view of how to do it. The state has to organise the economy. I come from a place called Lee in uh, in Greater Manchester, I, I, and, and I go back a lot to those small towns in Greater Manchester, where, where and it's periphery where I come from. And I real, I, I, and I don't know what it's like in concept, but I'm, I'm thinking it's the same. The big problem is there's no money there. People haven't got enough money to live the decent life they want to. They're incredibly nostalgic about the times when they were able to earn enough money, and they also realise they haven't got enough power to do anything about it. And if we, the, if we in Labour can stick to our knitting, which is to explain to people how they get more money and more power, more control over their own lives, better jobs, more secure tenancies, I think we can win. But know. have we heard any of that from Keir Starmer? We're starting to. I think one of the important things to the to the next generation is the decarbonisation of this economy. Um, it It is Equally true in places like Concept, you know, that you could describe as places that have become ex-industrial. We, the future of, of manufacturing and of places that used to make things is making green things. And Labour has put in £28 but, billion behind that. And I mean, that's something I don't Tories know the done. name of Sean's local pub, but I doubt whether down the local dog and duck they're talking about the decarbonisation of the economy or the green agenda. I bet their children are. Because their children, you know, 50% of our young people go to some form of uh, tertiary and uh, higher education. And many of them are being directed into, uh, into jobs and industries and skill sets where, where green is the thing. And they know that they'll pick up the pieces in the form of you know, floods, uh, coastal erosion, uh, freak weather events. Uh, and I think, I don't buy this idea that working class people who come from places like where I come from are not, not interested in in decarbonising. What they want to know is what kind of jobs will we get and how will our town centre get better or will it get worse because it'll all be done somewhere else by somewhere else. I think devolving power, which I think you're going to find is a big labour offer at the next election. No, no decision without us, no decision about us without us, I think should be one of Labour's absolute themes. That's in the next election. It's, it's, it's something that, that, that people often demand, but I, I, you know, you know, I've made this failed attempt to try and become a Labour MP. If I try again, it's that'll be my time. slogan. I, that'll time. be my slogan. No decisions about us without us. Um, get put people in charge of, 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 of rescuing local communities. I don't know what it's like in concept, but I, I, I can know what it's like in so many places like it. The big theme is how brilliant it used to be. Let's make it brilliant again. Don't you think once you get to a certain age, though, we all sort of start hankering after a golden age that perhaps never was? I, I do think that the, the 60s and 70s in which I grew up, I saw my own family advance. You know, my dad's a lorry driver. All my ancestors were miners. So my family tree goes, miner, 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 lorry driver, economics editor of the BBC. <laughs> That's because Labour governments after the war created opportunities for people like my family. And... All we want is to return to the opportunity. We don't want to return to the, the Jimmy Savile days, all those bad things that happened in the 60s and 70s. But I take the levels of opportunity that were offered to me, again, okay. like a shot. Phoebe? I think two things um, as, as Keir Starmer begins to face off against Liz Truss. The first one is, is that clearly Starmer struggled to find his voice against Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson's very blustery manner, quite a difficult man to face off against at PMQs. Good government needs good opposition. Hopefully, I think, and I really do think actually that he'll find um, he'll find Truss easier to deal with. He'll be able to, um, I think, just think we'll see a better stand of opposition on that front. The second thing is, is that I was really struck by some focus grouping from not too long ago, I think just before Her Majesty's death, the extent to which Liz Truss has actually got a very low profile mm -hmm. outside of Westminster. I mean, that's an opportunity for her, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for Labour. You know, I mean, she's blundering around, talking about banker bonuses. We've got this not particularly impressive fiscal event on Friday. Labour can step in, potentially define her premiership, you know, stick her with an unflattering label that's going to be really difficult to shift before the next general election. Whether or not that happens um, remains to be seen, but I don't think you can deny it's an opportunity. I love the way you say this not particularly impressive fiscal event when it hasn't actually happened yet. So and it's the biggest you don't know history. whether it's impressive or not. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Sam, now, so the question is, is Keir Starmer the right man to lead Labour into the next general election? Well, of course, he sacked you not that long ago, didn't he, from the front bench? 
We don't see eye to eye on everything, clearly. Um, and if look, you... at the end of it, well, actually, we do see eye to eye on quite a few things, and one is actually how transformative a Labour government uh, can be. I mean, look, Labour Party, you know, I had my differences. I think he was wrong to have sacked me for that. Actually, I think probably vast majority of Labour Party members and probably most of the PLP agreed with me, and certainly all the trade unions. Didn't he actually did. sack you not for appearing on the picket line, but for doing unauthorised media it's interviews? In fact, I think one was with me. Sort of afterwards at a rapid rate of knots, but I think the damage was already done. I mean, why create a straw man, you know, our opposition is the government, is the Tory party, you know, the vicious austerity that we've had, followed by, you know, disastrous handling of COVID, you know, now absolutely, you know, uh, plans are going to make, you know, many people richer, but the vast majority of people less well off in this country. And so actually, I think, you know, creating a situation where we're trying to define ourselves against, you know, the trade unions, you know, that's that's some sort of nonsense that should be left in the 1990s. We don't need to do that now. You know, I think actually trade unions have grown over the past few years. Most people, you know, I, I literally had someone coming up to the street to shake my hand today for state making that stand. Labour is clearly going to need to be on the side of work. Just on that, while I think of it, Christina McInerney, the new, gen- well, I say new, relatively new General Secretary of Unison, she's going to be with me tomorrow between eight and nine taking calls on the programme. So if you've got calls for... Uh, Unison is now the biggest trade union in the country, I think, isn't it? It's to overtaken Unite. So there'll be lots of things to talk to her about tomorrow. No, absolutely. But look, there is a huge opportunity for Labour. OK, we cannot afford to disallow uh, the Tories to just, you know, be disastrous, you know, for Trump to just stumble around. It's been pretty unimpressive, I have to say, um, over the past few days even. Uh, you know, when I saw Keir Starmer give his eulogy to the to the Queen, you know, I actually thought he did look like a Prime Minister. I thought it was a, a fantastic speech compared to, I don't know who, you know, I'd be firing my speechwriters if I was uh, Liz Truss already. And that's just been a matter of days, to be quite frank. They need so to I think that the is a big opportunity. I think she, the <laughs> well, I think she a actually wrote it herself. That we can't see this as an opportunity that we're just going to stumble into government. We actually do mm. need to, you have to, win to the right explain to government, don't you? what our programme is to transform this country, to give people hope, not just to lift people out of poverty, but give you know a whole generation of people who feel that they haven't got that hope, that they don't have the opportunities that their parents and grandparents had, that they're never going to be able to afford their own home, they're not going to be able to afford to go to university, and actually their family are about to get hammered by huge energy prices. And yes, obviously, you know it is going to be an improvement what's offered on Friday, but it's certainly no near enough because the tectonic plates of the economy are shifting you know the climate crisis is so serious as paul said of course you know some blokes sitting down the pub may not be talking about it but he's certainly been t- going to be talking about it when his house is getting flooded or forest fires burning his house down after 40 degree temperatures this summer this is something that's becoming very real okay. to people but it's an opportunity if labor grabs it alicia no, I think it's going to be very interesting as we see them kind of establish their rhythm against each other because uh, I agree entirely that Keir really did struggle with the way in which Boris approaches things and it actually meant we didn't have as serious a debate as we needed about the real detail at Dispatch Box, which we want to see. But I, I do just want to challenge the view that Friday isn't going to be enough. You know, £150 billion, that is taxpayers' money that will have to be paid back at some point that is to help to get people through. When I speak to my constituents, they are worried and they are scared, but they also recognise that the money has to come from somewhere and they know this isn't a crisis that we've created. People are grateful for the help that's come out, the help that's come out, say, for businesses. But it is very interesting that the narrative has been created, it won't be enough. Well, it, will it ever be enough? Can it be enough in such a situation as this? We didn't create the situation. We cannot pay people's bills entirely. That just is not possible. And it is important we don't infantilise the public and we have that adult conversation with them. Do we have to help the most vulnerable? Yes, £150 billion is not something to be sniffed at. Paul, if we think back to the 70s and 80s when we had various energy crises and inflation crises, I don't remember there being calls then for the government to step in and bail everyone out. The government certainly didn't do that. Have we become a nation that expects the government to step in at any moment of difficulty? I I think we have. Um, And I don't necessarily think this is a bad, uh, bad thing because we live in an era of external shocks you know i stood on uh, on fifth avenue new york and watched lehman brothers go bust in 2008 watch people come out with their plastic their paper bags and then you know then it was the eurozone's turn and then it was you know covid and now we've got uh, russian you know aggression against ukraine you you the this is the time of the state this is the time of the big state that's Boris Johnson understood that. Uh, I think Liz Truss kind of understands it, but 
she's been brought to leadership by a bunch of people, you know, 100,000 people plus, who don't quite understand it and still live in the world that we need, uh, you know, small state, low taxation. None of these problems are going to be solved uh, by that. And I think that, therefore, the question is... All right, 150 billion, if that's what it is, 130, 150, it is big, and I and we welcome it. When we say it's not enough, the point is, is it enough to reset the economy around a growth strategy that can deliver real wealth, not trickling down, but flowing down into the communities of Britain that have been just left into okay. rot? That's that's the, the how she should be judged. Thank you very much for all your answers on that. We'll take more of your questions in just a moment. It's 8.45. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. A trimmed down coronation because we will have a slimmed down monarchy. Clive in Fife. Clive, your reaction to that news? Frankly, hilarious. The fact that we've still got a royal family. Right. Because we have no place in a modern, civilised society. The majority of people I know couldn't care less if the monarchy existed or didn't exist. I wonder if you'd listen to a fellow person from Fife, Beatrice. What would you like to say to Clive? Well, I think he's talking up absolute nonsense. What happened in the last 10 days was absolutely wonderful. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With Motorway, a dealer's compete to give you their best price for your car. LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text date four eight five zero. It's eleven minutes to nine on LBC. Let's continue with your questions to our panel. James is in Walsall. Hello, James. Oh no, it's a text. Sorry, my fault. Uh, what more could the government be doing to calm the disturbances in Leicester and in Birmingham last night? Well, your constituents isn't a million miles away from Leicester, Alicia, so I'll come to you first. What, what lies behind these disturbances? Um, so it actually touches my constituency. So Leicester East is my next door uh, neighbourhood. So people have been really concerned about this. And I actually just want to start by praising Rob Nixon, who's our acting chief constable, because I actually think he's done an exceptional job in a really difficult circumstance. And I think people are always quick to attack the police but actually the last two nights we haven't seen um, disruption we've seen I think 47 arrests people have been charged action is being taken um, 
But it is really worrying to me, and I don't really know how it all truly kicked off. And I think what's been really concerning to me is on the one side, people trying to apologise away the fact that we're seeing this appalling behaviour, masked people attacking each other, lack of respect for religious freedom. And is it as simple as Muslims versus Hindus? It does look to be exactly that, and it looks to be the result of a cricket match. There's always more to everything, and I think unless you're truly part of that community, you can't really understand exactly what's going on. But I am really concerned about, on one side, it's giving people who want to be racist an excuse to go ahead and say, we've imported, you know, look, look at this appalling cultural, you know, ethnic diversity we've got in this country. This is the result of what you get. And on the other side, you've got, oh, we must not talk about this, will upset communities. It is unacceptable to see this behaviour on our streets. And what I'm particularly interested by is that we all know that when it comes to any diplomatic initiative, women are really important as part of that peacekeeping process and part of that mm. process of bringing people together. What we're seeing on our screens is men after men after men mm. talking about we have every right to be angry or, you know, mm. we have every right. And this in indignant anger that somehow it's acceptable to hate people because of who they are. E and their even when readings. their own faith leaders speak out vehemently yeah. against what's going on. That, that's, yeah. I think, an interesting... And the fact that it's spread to Birmingham. We should yeah. be really concerned. We need to crack down on this. And I think, you know, from what we've seen in other parts of the countries with teachers scared into silence, we cannot be silent when we see division on our streets and we see hatred being expressed in this way we have to act and i'm grateful and i had a call with the home secretary about uh, four hours ago on this which i can't talk about the detail unfortunately um but she is gripping it she's having calls with colleagues and rob nixon has done an exceptional job paul i think what i, I lived in leicester for um indeed in this area uh in or the other the area which is the muslim area north evington um i welcome the you know the sort of the responsible but fairly strong policing because you have to do that talking to people on the ground there is it, what we're not talking we're talking about two groups of young lads who are pretty disconnected from from sort of politics and society um in in the case of, of some of the hindu young men they are fairly recent arrivals from a from a from part of gujarat uh, that means they're at the bottom of the tree in terms of employment they feel pretty disconnected okay we can understand that we, we, it doesn't excuse the violence what we're not quite getting our heads around is that is disinformation i think this country has a long way to go to understand what a whatsapp group or a telegram channel can do in terms of inflaming the mm. kind of sectarian violence that we've that we've seen which thankfully has still been pretty low level and we, we of course first saw that in 2011 in the london riots didn't we where blackberry messenger was used yes. But, we, but look, let's be clear. We have a strong and legitimate uh, prevent policy. I think I've got big criticisms of it, but yes, there have been. We've got the far right are being under surveillance. We've got Islamist extremists under surveillance. We need to understand that coming from the Indian, Indian subcontinent, there is also Hindu fascism. There is there is far right Hindu Hindutva uh, ideology that is reportedly being what's what's been driving one side of this i would like law enforcement uh and all the agencies who feed into that to begin understanding how strong an impact that might be having um and then just make sure that we educate our police our schools our local community leaders to understand one whatsapp message in the indian subcontinent can set off death events we are now seeing it is spread to to, to birmingham i have no doubt will be driven by disinformation mm. from actors who may not even be in this country. And that's a sad thing to say, and I'm, I'm really glad that the Leicestershire police have got their, their hands on it, but from my information on the ground, that's not been so easy to... You know, we're not ahead of it. We're running behind it. Maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is about Hinduism and Islam. This has nothing to do with the religion. That's why people involved have been ignoring what their faith leaders have been saying. Mm. As, as Paul was saying, you know, this is about fascism. This is about bored young men who have been whipped up by ringleaders. Perhaps they're vulnerable to that because they don't feel that they have a good stake in society. Um, and I feel, you know, I feel so sorry for the communities in which this violence has happened. The policing has been fantastic. But now what we need, I mean, this violence didn't just erupt out of nowhere. There were warning signs. You know, we need to examine how exactly it is that it got to the point where these mobs on the streets, that the police were needing to manage that incredi incredibly difficult policing work. And um, I have absolute faith that it'll be got under control by the authorities. But, you know, clearly this is a worry and we need to make sure that this sort of situation doesn't arise again because it's just not acceptable. Sam. 
So I represent Ilford South, one of the most diverse uh, communities in the entire country in terms of my constituency. I have a Hindu temple uh, within 20 metres of my front door and the biggest mosque in Ilford within 20 metres of my constituency front door. I've spent most of this week dealing with this issue, in fact. Um, I was actually one of the first MPs to write directly to the Home Secretary to ask, because actually one of the things wasn't about the cricket match, it was about a very extreme Hindu preacher that was on a tour of the UK. I'd done two things, right to the Home Secretary and obviously to Sadiq Khan, saying how on earth did this person even get let into the UK. You know, we do not need people who are that level of bigotry and tolerance and hatred and Islamophobia coming into the UK. At the same time, I reached out to my good friends at the Hindu temple and said to them, this is a big mistake. You know, this is going to cause real tensions. And they listened and they counselled that hate preacher coming to Ilford. You know, because actually in Ilford, we have for many years had fantastic interfaith relations. And you know, I had a background in interfaith relations as a, as a young person in Ilford. And you know, this is something, as, both, as Paul has said, that is about a very extreme ideology that hasn't been part, actually, of British South Asian communities, mm. driven by the RS which is a very extreme wing that supports the pretty brutal Modi government in India, now coming into political discourse amongst certain communities in the UK. And it does need to be taken really seriously because I can tell you as a population, as a politician who represents a population of, of, of tens of thousands of Hindus and tens of thousands of Muslims from both Gujarat and Pakistan, Bangladesh, that people are extremely concerned and it needs to be nipped in the bud now. And it needs to be made very, very clear that we have a zero tolerance approach to extremism in any you know, community. My local mosque know full well if they turned up with an Islamic hate preacher, then I'd be on to them straight away saying, no chance, get them out of Ilford. There needs to be zero tolerance across. But in Ilford, we do also have a uh, large and mostly, you know, absolutely brilliant uh, uh, first generation Indian community, mainly coming to work in the city, actually, quite well paid mm. jobs, uh, IT jobs. Um, and you know, I have had conversations with him, and there is a, a much stronger political ideology that's straight from the Indian subcontinent that isn't something we've dealt with here in the UK before and we need an honest conversation about that it needs to be done in a way that brings communities together not drives them apart but it does need to be tackled we don't need any more fascists in the UK I remember going to speak to a school in your constituency a couple of years ago and I think it's 85% non-white and it was actually really quite inspirational to see how everyone had integrated and I, my, my main memory of that was an 11 year old boy in the front row when we got to questions he stuck up his hand his first question is how much do you earn <laughs> <laughs> and let's not forget Leicester has worked as a, as, a con, as a city that is, I think, close to being a majority non-white city mm. that has quite distinct Hindu, Muslim and Sikh populations as well as African Caribbean. It has worked through the hard work of people who are now looking at this and saying, you know, wh how much does it, is it going to take for this to unravel? The, the, as I think we've, we've put our finger on it. There is an external force, and yeah. don't un underestimate the acceleration, acceleration power of social media and most ordinary law enforcement people have no idea well, about it. I'm glad, I'm glad we've had this question because I, I've debated that this week as to whether we should do a phone-in on it. And we haven't. And one of, one of the reasons I haven't done it is because you don't want to inflame it by no. sort of really... Uh, and inevitably, you're going to get people phoning in on, on either side. And it, what do you get out of that? Yeah. Probably more conflict. And so, Paul's absolutely right. We should celebrate the fact that actually within this country, we don't have these appalling tensions that when you go to these other countries... I spent time with 60 unaccompanied um, Pakistani boys a few years ago. And the level of hatred for Indians and for Hindus mm. was horrifying until they met a friend of mine who's American. And when she spoke Hindu, they were like, we understand what you're saying. We how how are our languages so similar? And their level of hatred was so extreme. It, and it's until the fear of the unknown, it, isn't it? Yeah. And in the past, you wouldn't have been able to find someone who would allow you to identify with this hatred and accept it. But social media allows you. To. Um, I'm going to apologise to Pauline in Watford. We're not going to have time to get to your call, Pauline. Um, but do call in again next week. But we do have time for this final text question from Tamara in Liverpool. Uh, Petta, the animal rights group, says women should go on a sex strike against men who eat meat because of climate change. Is this clever or just plain sexist? Phoebe. Uh, You're a vegan, aren't you? I am a vegan. Um, I had to get that in there on this show today. Um, uh, it is sexist. And, you know, when I, when I met my fiancé, um, he wasn't a vegan. And now he is one. And um, I didn't have to resort to any blackmail or underhand tactics in the course of our relationship. <laughs> uh, veganism's got lots of good arguments, got lots of things to recommend it. Um, yeah, an unnecessary suggestion from Peter. Paul? There is, of course, a Greek play by Aristophanes about when the women of Athens go on a sex strike. And um, it ends 
by both the women and the men not being able to keep it up. Let's put it uh, as politely as that. They can't... They can't keep it up. They can't keep well, that... it going. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia? I think it's quite a sexist assumption that many meat and women don't in the first mm. place. I'm, I'm a proud uh, representative of many, many farmers. But secondly, the idea that women somehow enjoy sex less than men. Exactly. So therefore they'd be punishing the man by with, mm. you know, refusing sex and that women use it as a bargaining tool. It just feeds into all the worst narratives of the 90s that, yeah, sex, women use sex. It's not something they enjoy and that they should use it as a tool against men. It's, you know, it's, it's also incredibly... Uh, focused on uh, straight relationships. Hmm. What about mm. are your gay partner meant to withhold sex from you until you become... Has done for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Sam? I'm just glad I've been vegetarian for 33 years, is what I would say. It's, that's not far enough, Sam, apparently. <laughs> no. It's not. Is that your answer? Pretty much. I mean, look, I mean, cl clearly it's just a, it's a sort of shock tactic, isn't it, from PETA? You know, they like to do these sorts of things where it's throwing paint over people or just trying yeah. to do shock tactics. I don't think, you know, there's a single woman in the UK that's going to deny uh, their partner sex on the basis of whether they're having a beef burger or a steak. Uh, and certainly uh, that's uh, yeah, something I'd be... Uh, I'm just glad I'm vegetarian, put it that way. <laughs> well, if I need to keep you listening, let me tell you, I'm going to be interviewing the female director of PETA at half past nine, so you'll want to hear that i'm sure um sam alicia phoebe and ball thank you very much indeed for joining us on cross question don't forget if you missed any cross question this week you can catch up on the podcast uh, or on global player coming up in a moment as i said we are going to talk about this sex right that's not going to be the phone in i'm not stupid um i can't actually remember what our phone in is going i know what it is therese coffee the new health secretary is going to solve the gp crisis tomorrow uh, let's try and find out how it's one minute past nine on your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 9 o'clock, more than 1,000 people have been arrested in Russia while protesting against the war in Ukraine. They've taken to the streets to voice their anger after Vladimir Putin announced 300,000 reservists will be sent into the conflict. The president also claims he's not bluffing when he says he could turn to nuclear weapons if he's provoked. The Prime Minister Liz Truss, meantime, is in New York, where her talks with the US President Joe Biden have mainly been about Russia. We are steadfast allies and I've enjoyed working with um, Tony Blinken uh, very closely in our response on Russia's appalling war in Ukraine. Crime Stoppers has increased its rewards to find those responsible for the death of Olivia Pratt Corbell to £200,000. The nine-year-old was killed during a shootout between two strangers who forced their way into her home in Liverpool. Police believe one of the guns involved is being stored in the area where she lived. Donald Trump and his adult children are being sued for fraud by New York State Attorney General. It follows a three-year civil investigation into the former president's business practices. The state investigated whether the Trump organisation misstated the values of its real estate properties to obtain favourable loans and tax benefits. Donald Trump denies any wrongdoing. The late Queen's name has been added to the ledger stone in the chapel at Windsor Castle where she was buried on Monday. Her Majesty was laid to rest with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, her parents and sister in the George VI Memorial Chapel. Deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, has told the News Agents podcast the moment the Commons were passed a note. It took place during the new Prime Minister's announcement on energy bills. So the note was kind of that the Queen's unwell and that Keir needs to leave the chamber as soon as possible to be briefed. I read between the lines on that because you don't get a note saying the Queen's unwell if she's got a bit of a cough and cold. In the middle of what was a very, even before that news, that was the most important news of the day, you know, the cost of living crisis. And you can listen to the news agents on Global Player. LBC markets report the FTSE 100s closed up 44 points at 72.37. The pound buys $1.13 and €1.14. Euro LBC weather, rain for Northern Ireland and the rest of Scotland tonight. Elsewhere dry with a low of 9 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is...